This is the first of three lectures on inductive reasoning. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about induction and what it is, uh, and also talk a little bit about uh, inductive inferences and generalizations, and we'll also talk a little bit about correlation and causal inferences. In the other lectures, I'm going to talk about some philosophical backgrounds to the idea of induction, and then in the third lecture, I'll talk about categorical induction. The first thing I want to do is make a distinction between deductive and inductive thinking. Uh, now I'll have a whole series of lectures on deductive logic uh, coming up, uh, but for now let's just uh, make a very simple distinction between the two. Deductive thinking is when a hypothesis leads to systematic observations. Premises uh, lead to a conclusion, and you're usually going from a general idea to a specific conclusion. And in deductive logic, we want to know whether or not a specific conclusion is valid or sound. In induction, on the other hand, it tends to be specific to general. So this is where you make observations and you draw some conclusions about the things that you've observed. Uh, you make a hypothesis. Uh, so it tends to be specific to general, but we often talk about specific inferences or conclusions. Uh, so for now, deductive is a general to specific. Inductive tends to be specific to general. But when you make an inference, of course, any individual decision or inference or prediction is going to be a specific prediction. We're usually just making it on these general observations. So inferences, what we're going to call inferences, are conclusions based on the available evidence. So these can be things that you've observed, remembered, or some combination of them. These can be very specific about a spe one particular person or one particular thing, or they can be general statements about what you think is true. Let's look at some examples. So let's look at some specific inferences. So I talk about this example in the textbook. Uh, this used to happen. Now, as I mentioned in the little call out on this slide, this doesn't happen anymore because I got rid of a landline telephone in my house about five years ago. So I don't get quite as many calls as I used to, though I still get them. Uh, but especially when I had a landline, and this phone number had been in uh, service for yeah, maybe since 2003, so it's a number we had for a long time. It had sort of gotten around, right? Uh, telemarketers, people who would call and try to get you to buy some service, would often call between the hours of 4 and 7. They would call the home phone between 4 and 7. Uh, and so the inference is uh, this has happened in the past, right? So trying to make dinner, phone rings, uh, and I would either pick it up or we would have one of those old-fashioned answering machines that would uh, take the call and rather than go to voicemail, it would go to sort of an old-fashioned answering machine so you could hear the person on the line leaving a message. Uh, so I usually didn't pick it up, so I inferred that the caller was not worth talking to. I was using my past experience, so every time somebody calls between 4 and 7, they're not worth talking to. Every time it's happened in the past, I'm assuming that uh, it's a telemarketer. So when it happens in the present, or any time it happens, I'm just assuming that it's going to be like all of the others. Every time it's happened in the past, it's been a telemarketer, so I'm no longer going to even bother picking up the phone because I'm just going to predict that it's going to be a telemarketer again. Right? That's an inference based on prior observations and applying it to a current situation. On the other side of this, of course, the companies that are calling are also making a prediction. They're basing their assumptions on the idea that people will be home uh, between 4 and 7. Uh, that's when uh, many people are home from work, uh, or if they work in the evening, that's sort of when the shifts uh, might change over. Uh, there's usually a meal coming up in the next few hours. So this is a really good time to reach people at their home phone number. Uh, so the telemarketers are making that prediction based on their prior experience. I'm making my prediction that it's going to be a telemarketer uh, based on my prior experience. So this is an example of a specific inference. I've made some observations. I've made a general belief uh, or a general conclusion, uh, and I apply that every time somebody calls. At the heart of this, of course, is a generalization. Uh, so the generalization is what you form when you make these observations. The generalization is an inductive conclusion about a whole class or a whole group of things. 
So in a previous uh, lecture, we talked about positive or negative associations with police officers. And I suggested that if you uh, formed a concept of police officers based on your experience, and those experiences were positive, you would likely have a positive generalization. So that when you meet somebody who says they're a police officer, you would make a positive inference. You would infer positive features. If you've had negative experiences with police officers, police officers in the past, uh, then those negative experiences would allow for a generalization that's more negative. So that when you see a police officer or meet a police officer, you might draw on those negative conclusions. So this generalization is something you can apply to individuals. Uh, for example, another example, Queens students and Western students. Uh, it's traditional rivalry, right? Uh, Queens students uh, and Western students are always uh, comparing, uh, especially in previous years when there would be uh, homecoming celebrations or football games or those kinds of things. Now, let's suppose, based on a few negative interactions, Western students might form a negative generalization about Queen students. And that becomes sort of the basis of a stereotype, right? Uh, I mean, in reality, Western students and Queen students probably have a lot more in common than they have different. Uh, but there are lots of ways in which some of those generalizations build up over time. Uh, and this is the basis of stereotypes and prejudices. Uh, let's look at a very specific example uh, from the literature uh, that shows how these stereotypes and prejudices give rise to uh, faulty reasoning. So here's a, a study. Uh, this is an old study from the 1980s, uh, but it holds up really well. Uh, and this has to do with a particular type of reasoning error called the conjunction fallacy. Now, the reason I'm using it here, and we'll probably talk about this example in other classes and other lectures, but I want to use it here because it shows how these stereotypes underlie uh, our beliefs about people uh, and can cause us to miss obvious conclusions uh, that are logically accurate. Uh, so in other words, people are uh, ignoring what should be the case about laws of probability, which... I know we haven't talked about very much in this class yet. We will. Uh, but people are going to ignore some basic probability laws uh, in favor of their uh, stereotypes and prejudices and concepts and generalizations. So let's look at some of the examples. In this case, uh, what subjects are going to be presented with is a list of descriptions of a person. Uh, these people will be in different uh, categories. And you're going to rank what is the most likely and the least likely. Let's look at the examples that uh, Tversky and Kahneman used. And think about, in each one of these, think about whether or not it brings to mind a stereotype or a generalization based on inductive reasoning. So you've given, you're, in this experiment, you're given two or more uh, personality profiles. And this looks like one of the ones that we looked at before. We talked about uh, representativeness with uh, the farmers and librarians in a previous lecture. Uh, so here we have this very similar idea. We've got Bill, who's 34 years old. He's intelligent but unimaginative, compulsive, and generally lifeless. In school, he was strong in mathematics but weak in social studies and humanities. Uh, so this should uh, remind you of people. Uh, maybe it, parts of it remind you of some people, parts of it remind you of other people. Uh, but what it should do is remind you of examples uh, that you can then use to form a stereotype or uh, a generalization. And then you're asked to rank the following statements about Bill in terms of the most likely to the least likely. So Bill is a physician who plays poker for a hobby. Bill is an architect. He's an accountant. He plays jazz for a hobby. He surfs for a hobby. He's a reporter. He's an accountant who plays jazz for a hobby and he climbs mountains for a hobby. Some of these might seem like they are uh, reasonable. Uh, others might seem like they're maybe not so reasonable. And then maybe others you just don't have a strong opinion on. Uh, what most people are going to find is uh, that Bill as an accountant ranks pretty high. Uh, this sounds like someone uh, that maybe fits with a stereotype of someone who would be a good accountant, someone who's strong in mathematics, uh, but maybe not very imaginative. And again, I'm not trying to criticize uh, accountants. These were designed to draw on people's 
uh, stereotypes. Uh, if you are planning to go into accounting uh, or uh, already work in accounting, uh, this doesn't mean you're unimaginative. Uh, this simply means uh, that it's designed in the 1980s uh, to try to uh, evoke a particular kind of stereotype and cause people to think about their stereotypes. Uh, let's look at the second one, and we'll spend a little bit more time on the second one. Uh, Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. She majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. She also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. And then you're supposed to rank uh, the following. She's a teacher in elementary school. Linda works in a bookstore, takes yoga classes. She's active in the feminist movement. Uh, Linda is a psychiatric social worker. Linda is a member of the League of Women Voters. This is a particular organization in the United States uh, that uh, was designed to sort of uh, sponsor uh, feminist candidates in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, Linda's a bank teller. Uh, bank teller uh, is uh, someone who just works in a bank uh, at the front desk, uh, usually uh, depositing money or uh, cashing checks, that type of thing. Uh, Linda's an insurance person. Uh, Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. Uh, now, the, T, the F and the T and the T and the F just show you some of the ones that we're going to be looking at uh, in the next slide. Uh, so people are asked to rank these descriptions about Linda based on their stereotype, which is a form of induction, right? So you've seen people in the past who are outspoken, bright philosophy majors, uh, interested in social justice, and so on. So suppose you already have a stereotype. This should activate the stereotype, and then you're going to use this generalization to make some predictions. That's what induction is. And so what we're essentially asking subjects to do uh, is tell us which of these inductions are most likely, in this case it's going to be active in the feminist movement, and which are least likely. But there's also going to be a catch. So here's their description, and then I'm going to show you some data we collected in my class last, uh, last winter. Uh, so as the reader has probably guessed, the description of Bill was constructed to be representative of an accountant and unrepresentative of a person who plays jazz for a hobby. Uh, and the description of Linda was constructed to be representative of an active feminist and unrepresentative of a bank teller. The reason I've described bank teller uh, is in the 1980s. Now, remember, I'm 50 years old, so I was an adolescent in the 1980s. Uh, the only way you could really easily get money from the bank, your own bank account that you would have, whether it's your own money or uh, money that some, you know, maybe your parents have given you an allowance when you're a teenager, or maybe you have a part-time job, is to go to a physical bank and fill out a deposit slip, a uh, little short piece of paper, hand it to a person who works at the counter, and then they give you a stack of cash. Or you would write a check to yourself and cash that check. Uh, they didn't have cash machines back then, or debit machines, uh, or ATM. Uh, the T in the word ATM stands for automated teller machine. Uh, so the teller is just the person who counts the money out. Uh, we didn't have debit. We didn't have cards. We didn't have Apple Pay or Google Pay in those days. You had to carry around cash or write a check. The only way to get cash was to go to the bank uh, and ask for cash to be given to you from a bank teller. So the reason bank teller is listed here is there's no particular strong stereotype uh, that's evoked with Linda's description and the type of person who might work at a bank teller. A lot of people might work at a bank teller. There's a lot of variability there. Uh, whereas active feminist really fits well with the description of Linda. So a group of 88 undergraduates at UBC ranked the eight statements associated with each description. Uh, the results confirmed our expectations. The percentages of respondents who displayed the predicted order um, and for Linda would be feminist would be ranked higher than Teller plus feminist would be ranked higher than Teller alone. Uh, we're 87% and 85%. The reason they think this is surprising, and the reason they call this a conjunction fallacy, is that if you rate feminist high, and if you rank uh, Teller somewhere a little bit lower, the combination or the conjunction of those two has to be lower. In other words, if someone is already a feminist and maybe much less likely to be a bank teller, they would have to be the conjunction of those two uh, would be a number lower. 
Uh, so you, you know, the conjunction of two properties is always going to be a lower uh, probability. Uh, you're more likely to be in one category than in two categories together. And what uh, Tversky and Kahneman are showing is that people make this mistake. They always rank the conjunction higher, uh, the conjunction that happens to have uh, the strongly associated inductive inference with it. Uh, so I want to show you some data I collected from uh, our class uh, in uh, the winter. So usually what I would do in a lecture is we'd you know, have a link, uh, or we'd show this on the screen, or I would have a link to a, uh, you know, a Qualtrics uh, uh, survey site, and uh, we would spend five minutes in class uh, all doing the survey, and then we would look at the data. So uh, I just want to show you the data we collected last year. But these would be students just like you. Uh, these, I think we had about uh, maybe 50 students who answered uh, in, in that class. Uh, so here's just the rank order, uh, and I've blocked out uh, some of the ones that um, we're not concerned with, and I've left open uh, the blue, which is Linda is active in the feminist movement, uh, the orange, which is Linda is a bank teller, and the conjunction, which is Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, and our results confirmed what Tversky and Kahneman found as well. You can see that when people read that description of Linda, the bright and outspoken philosophy major who's interested in social justice. Uh, active and feminist movement really seems to uh, line up with that. That's an inductive inference that's easy to make from that particular stereotype and generalization. Uh, so that's why it's listed. Most people ranked it first. Uh, the x-axis on the bottom there shows rank order. Uh, Linda is a bank teller. Most people don't know what to do with that. Uh, for one thing, uh, there's no particular personality type for a bank teller. And for another thing, most of us don't interact with bank tellers very often. Uh, so it probably doesn't have a strong association with, association with anything. So most people rank that pretty low, six, seven, or eight. Uh, and you can see that uh, Linda is a bank teller and active in the feminist movement, uh, was generally ranked higher than Linda is a bank teller alone. Uh, so you can see that uh, of these different categories, uh, the conjunction uh, was ranked higher than the bank teller answer uh, in several, in just about every uh, earlier uh, ranking. So uh, it was higher in the number two position, higher in the number three position, the four position, the five position. Uh, so in those middle ranks, people like the conjunction. Uh, this suggests that we have strong feelings about people's personalities. Uh, we have strong stereotypes, and they cause us to make inferences that sometimes make us ignore uh, individual conclusions. Okay, the final example in this uh, lecture, I want to talk a little bit about correlational and causal reasoning. Uh, we all know what a correlation is. Uh, you've studied this before in your intro psychology class. You probably studied it in uh, other classes, statistics class, and so on. Uh, we all know what a correlation is, right? It's a relationship between two variables. Uh, a positive correlation means that if A increases, variable A, then B increases along with it. Uh, and a negative correlation is the case where if A increases, B decreases. In other words, there's a relationship between two things. Uh, we also know, now although there's a relationship between correlation and causally related things, uh, we also know that no causation can be determined through correlation. So scientifically, uh, we're well aware that although things may be correlated, there may not be a causal relationship uh, between them. But people make the mistake often. Sometimes results are presented as if there's a causation, and sometimes people interpret correlation as causation. So why do people make the mistake? Well, one reason we probably make the mistake is that there are lots of things that go together, uh, and we just don't know why they go together. Uh, we can probably guess there's no causal relationship uh, but in other cases, we can sort of speculate at a causal relationship. So here's a plot that I pulled from an example of uh, spurious correlations, uh, suggesting the relationship, a strong relationship between uh, the murder rate in the United States declining over time uh, and the Internet Explorer browser market share. So it, uh, Microsoft's original Internet Explorer web browser. Uh, as its market share declined, so did the murder rate. I mean, this is a pretty clear, strong relationship between the two. 
uh, we would never infer that there's a causal relationship between them. Lots of other examples of, of spurious correlations. So on the top, you can see the per capita consumption of cheese in the United States between the years 2000 and 2009, and the number of people who have died becoming tangled in their bed sheets, uh, which is not a lot of people, but I mean, it does happen, as you can see, uh, and it seems to be oddly related uh, to the per capita consumption of cheese. Uh, here's another one. You've probably, you may have even seen this one before. Uh, the number of people who have drowned by falling into swimming pools, which is a tragedy, uh, and it goes up and down uh, across the years, but it seems to have increased a little bit. And it, strangely enough, it correlates pretty strongly with the number of films that uh, Nicolas Cage has appeared in. So these are things that seem to have a relationship, uh, but there doesn't appear to be a causal link between them. Uh, and so it's common to sort of see these examples and wonder what's the, you know, is there a relationship? Is there a causal relationship? It's even a bit of a cliche to uh, remind people that correlation does not imply causation. Uh, and one question is, why do people like to say that? Uh, where did this idea come from? Well, uh, it comes, of course, uh, from the idea of correlation and the correlation coefficient uh, comes from Carl Pearson, who's a mathematician uh, and a statistician. Uh, and it's become sort of a bit of a cliche to even say correlation does not imply causation. There's a problem, though. Now, technically, or mathematically, or statistically, this is true. Uh, when there's a correlation between two things, uh, it's not enough to allow you to conclude that they're causally related. The problem is uh, that's what our mind tends to want to do anyway. When we see that there's a relationship between two things, uh, our mind is always looking for a causal relationship. This goes way back into uh, evolutionary history. Look at, a, at an animal. Uh, for example, I've probably talked about my uh, cat before uh, and how the cat sort of learns to do various things, right? It learns what kinds of behaviors she needs to do to wake people up or uh, she learns that the certain sounds are going to predict whether or not she's going to be fed. Uh, she's trying to figure out what causes one, you know, what causes something. She's trying to figure out how she can predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so we tend to have this tendency to look for uh, patterns and associations in the world and to try to draw inferences. And in many cases, those are causal influence, inferences. And when we create a story around those inferences, uh, it's often a causal story. So it is true from a statistics standpoint that Correlation does not imply causation, but we tend to do it anyway. Here's what Pearson wrote about it initially. Uh, so with the arrival of Pearson's coefficients and the transformation of statistics, that fallacy became more central to the debate. Should scientists even bother with a slippery concept like causation, which can't truly be measured in the lab and doesn't have a proper definition? Maybe not. Pearson's work suggested that causation might be irrelevant to science and that in certain ways, be indistinguishable from perfect correlation. So what Pearson was trying to suggest is that maybe we shouldn't worry about causation. We should just worry about correlation. Uh, the higher the correlation, the more certainly we can predict from one member what the value of the associated member will be. Uh, that gives you some power. That gives you some inferential predictive power. A strong correlation means that you can kind of know, if you measure one thing, what the other thing will be. He wrote in one of his major's works, The Grammar of Science, this is the transition of correlation into causation. Correlation doesn't prove causation, but it may be a necessary condition. And there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason is that causal things are correlated, right? So if one thing is the cause of another, uh, we're usually going to get that information or find out about that information by noticing the relationship between the two. Uh, it's one of the easiest and most fundamental ways to understand causation. Uh, we can make inferences about what one thing causes the other uh, by noticing those correlations. In other words, causally related things are correlated, but not all correlated things are causally related. Okay, that's enough for this lecture. Uh, once you've had a chance to go through and think about some of these things, I'll reflect back on some of the questions uh, that I I have on the website. Uh, and the next lecture will be about some of the philosophical underpinnings and backgrounds to uh, inductive reasoning.